Afternoon and evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I would like to welcome you to the July Ag Sector Council seminar titled, This Land is Whose Land? Navigating Issues of Land Rights and Governance. Uh, the monthly Ag Sector Council seminar series is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development or KDAD project. For those of you who regularly attend these seminars, thank you so much for returning. It's great to see a lot of familiar, uh, not faces, but familiar names in the chat box. Uh, for those of you for whom this is your first AgriLinks event, uh, we'd like you to know that we hold monthly seminars on a variety of topics that are of interest to ag development practitioners, and we place a heavy emphasis on participant engagement. Um, the agrilinks.org platform is an open community, and we always welcome comments and contributions, so we look forward to seeing you in the future. So to introduce myself, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USA Bureau of Food Security. I'll be facilitating today and moderating the Q&A portion of this event. Allholder farmers, or who work with the private sector on agricultural investment projects, it's vital to understand the context of local land rights and governance. So I'm very excited to get this webinar underway. So to briefly go over just the structure of the webinar today, the agenda, We'll start with a brief introduction and context setting from Tony Piascovi, and then we'll move into our two main presentations. Because our first speaker, Delilah Rothenberg, can only be with us until about 10.30, we'll pause after her presentation for about 10 minutes of Q&A, um, and then we'll move along to Yulia Neyman, who's joining us from Ukraine, uh, to round out the event with some further Q&A at the end. So we'll have a bit of Q&A in the middle, and some questions at the end. But we always encourage you to um, enter your questions in the chat box at any time. And we will wrap up by 11 a.m. Eastern time at the latest. So with that, I would like to introduce Tony Piascovi to give a brief introduction. Tony is a Land Tenure Communications and Learning Specialist in the Land Tenure and Resource Management Office at USAID, with whom we're partnering today on this event. And he serves as a project manager of evaluation, research, and pilot activities for the office, and oversees implementation of communications and learning strategies. And previous to USAID, he spent eight years managing uh, US domestic programs in public health and housing sectors. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for that, for that nice introduction. I'm going, to, I'm going to keep my mind really, really brief, today, but I wanted, but I wanted to, to set the scene, scene for our session um, and, and go through, you know, why this topic and why today. So it's helpful to think back about seven or eight years, 2007, 2008, when global food prices were rising and the financial markets crashed. That's kind of the context for uh, our entire discussion today. Uh, and as a result of kind of those two events, we really saw a global um, uptake and increase in uh, new investments in agriculture. And, uh, and this occurred especially in Africa, but in other parts of the world as well. Um, and this really led to, to two issues. So how are we going to feed more people and, and how are we going to you know, pay for, um, for this effort? And, and how are we going to address uh, the weak land governance issues that exist that, that may um, prevent this from occurring? And so as I think everyone knows, um, in 09 at the G8 summit in Italy, President Obama um, announced a huge commitment that you know ultimately led to the creation of Feed the Future, uh, and since then the international community has has done several things um, to address food and land tenure insecurities. Um, and increasingly, the the land sector and the ag sector have been moving together. Um, uh, and so, in uh, 2012, you saw uh, the UN Committee on World Food Security in Rome. Um, endorse a negotiated um, non-binding document called the Voluntary Guidelines on Responsible Governance of Tenure of Land, Fisheries, and Forests in the Context of National Food Security, long title there, um, shortened most, uh, in most instances to VGGT. 
Uh, but really, this was the first effort um, by on the international stage um, of over 90 countries coming together and really um, negotiating and looking at, well, what does uh, land and resource governance look like? Or what should it look like? What rules uh, should we attempt or, or aspire to follow? Um, and so that's what's outlined in uh, in the voluntary guidelines for the governance of tenure, it's a it's a list of best practices and for for governments to follow um, in strengthening their land and resource governance systems. Um, so that was in 2012, and and shortly after those guidelines were um, endorsed, the um, the GA partners. Um, at the summit in the U.S., announced a new alliance for uh, food security and nutrition, uh, and and that also um, that also uh, brought together the land and the food security communities. Um, it endorsed or or, or reaffirmed um, the U.S. commitments to the voluntary guidelines for the governance of tenure, um, and and as a result of of the new alliance, uh, the cooperation framework, so the strategies for, for all new alliance countries have identified land as one of the areas in which um, they will work. So that was on the, um, on the host government, government side, um, the voluntary guidelines. And um, so to guide uh, on the private sector, in 2014, the same body uh, in Rome that negotiated uh, the voluntary guidelines, negotiated a new um, document, which is the Principles for Responsible Investment in Agriculture and Food Systems. And that really takes a look at uh, what actions the private sector can do um, to invest in agriculture in ways that uh, are sustainable and, and can benefit um, both investors and, and uh, communities and and local people. And I think it's really important um, to give this kind of broad context to say that each of these previous elements is kind of building and going forward. Uh, and so we've got, a we've got two presentations today um, that will kind of look at how this problem um, looks today. Um, and so our first presentation is, uh, is going to be by uh, Delilah Rothenberg, and uh, she's the Managing Director of Development Cap at Development Capital Strategies, which is an advisory firm specializing in sustainable business development and investment, um, with a particular focus in Sub-Saharan Africa. In this position, she provides advisory services focused on investor relations, financing, business development, and sustainable project development in accordance with IFC performance standards, Equator principles and other international standards, um, and the presentation that she will give is really going to kind of present the problem or, or, or present the challenges that we're facing in this sector uh, from the private sector uh, perspective, and I think that's going to be going to be very helpful and uh, and interesting for our audience. Uh, as Julie mentioned, we'll do a short Q and A session after uh, Delilah's presentation because she has to depart a little early. And then we'll move on to our second presenter, uh, who is my colleague at USAID, um, Yulia Naiman. And uh, Ms. Naiman is a land and governance, or land governance and legal advisor at USAID. Previously, she worked as a corporate lawyer at White and Case firm in New York City and at the World Bank. And uh, while a practicing attorney, she was involved with several land rights and indigenous rights projects. Uh, recently, she also worked with the UN Global Compact to create the Business Reference Guide to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And her presentation is going to focus on a new tool that USAID has developed uh, to help guide the private sector in its, um, in its investments around the world, not just in Africa, um, as they relate to uh, USAID's uh, food security and non-food security programs. Um, and so with that, I want to turn the uh, presenter's role over to Ms. Rothenberg. 
Uh, thanks very much, Tony. And hi. Um, so, so I was just saying that I became um, interested very early on in my um, studies, actually, when I was in uh, high school and college in sustainable um, measures to improve standards of living in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so when I was in college, I realized um, through some volunteer work and my studies that uh, job creation was really needed in Sub-Saharan Africa, and therefore uh, capital was needed um, to build businesses and create those jobs. And um, I decided to go into finance of all things, didn't study finance in, uh, in school, but um, ended up working in finance to learn how to attract capital to Sub-Saharan Africa, worked in in sort of mainstream finance with banks and um, you know boutique research firms for a few years, and then moved on to focus on Africa. And through my work, really realized that um, capital is good, but not all capital is good capital, and that um, and not all capital is is educated about the nuances of doing business in developing countries um, or in places that. Um, are still developing their, their regulatory frameworks that protect their citizens. Um, and so, so um, I became very, very interested in how to work with investors to educate them about the nuances of doing business in these countries and um, you know, really come to learn that a lot of these investors have uh, the best of intentions up front but are very challenged because of um, timelines and uh, their investor demands when they raise capital. And so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so just moving on to the, I can, uh, so slide six. Well, this is slide two. Um, I'm not sure why it says slide six. Um, so. Uh, what I want to talk about here is just that a lot of investors aren't familiar with the concepts of customary or informal land rights when they start to do business in um, countries like those in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it's, I've watched uh, a number of atten attendees in this um, seminar introduce themselves as they join. So uh, some of you might be familiar with these concepts, but there's there are customary or informal land rights in countries that haven't um, you know, fully uh, formalized their tenure systems yet and mapped out all of their land. And so for investors who are used to doing business in the United States, it's a real um, surprise to, to, it can frequently, I should say, be, because I don't want to stereotype everybody, but it can frequently be a real surprise to go over to a developing country, do business with a government that doesn't recognize informal or customary land rights. Um, and then the government hands over a land concession to the investor and says, you know, this land was under our, our control before and now we're going to lease it to you or we're going to sell it to you. And there might be people living on that land who feel like they have these customary or inform informal rights that are recognized by the international community, but, um, but the government doesn't recognize them. And so the investor ends up in a situation where you know, they think that they have rights to a land and rights to develop it, but they don't really realize who, that there are actually people on the land and that those people um, have rights and that um, you know, just developing without engaging them can cause certain human rights issues and conflicts. Um, the other issue uh, that can frequently come up when foreign investors go to a new country with a developing regulatory and political framework is that some ministries might not always be um, in touch with each other or there might not be a centralized um, uh, depository of information of when ministries give out different concessions or different um, uh, uh, establishment conventions um, and rights. And so, you know, particularly when it comes to giving out uh, finite resources like pieces of land, there can be instances where the same uh, piece of land is issued to two or more different investors, and that can cause an issue. So it's really important for the investors, um, you know, to be aware of these issues up front and to think about, you know, who they need to talk to in the country to ensure that they really do have that land and it hasn't been issued to anyone else. Um, furthermore, different ministries might have different incentives. So um, in, in one instance where I was working, it was in a uh, forested area, which um, you know, is frequent. It, it, I, guess it should, I should say it's not frequently the case in agribusiness, but it can be. 
Um, and there's Ministry of Forestry there, and they have a lot of aid money from a um, from a developed country's uh, NGO. And they're incentivized by that, and they're incentivized to create programs with that aid money um, to to you know conserve the forest. Yet other ministries, like the Ministry of Economy and Planning or the Ministry of Commerce, uh, might have different incentives. Like they might want to create industry in that area because it's remote and it's disconnected from markets, and people don't have jobs or opportunities. And so um, you know there's a real need, and I'll get into it later in this presentation. But there's a real need for stakeholder engagement. Um, and stakeholder mapping so that you know who has different interests in this area. And, and so the investor can think about how do I balance those different interests and make sure that everybody's happy. Um, and, and frequently, you know, investors just aren't used to that sort of situation. In developed markets where information systems are more um, mature and where uh, regulatory frameworks and political systems are also more mature. Um, you know, frequently also governments are eager to attract investment and create jobs, so they might issue large land concessions, which I think we're learning from over time with, with all the attention that our quote unquote land grabbing has attracted. And, um, you know, that's an interesting situation because it's evolved where um, it's, it's somewhat popular, I think, to, for governments to say, okay, well, we don't want you to speculate. Um, the city investors, we don't want you to speculate on this land, and we don't want you to just hold it, you know, until it increases in value. We want you to develop that land. So we're going to give you a five-year time frame to develop it, and if, you know, these certain thresholds aren't met by the end of the five years, we can take that land back for you, from you. But that also poses challenges for the investors, the project developers who are developing that land to raise their, you know, equity or debt financing, because their investors who are capitalizing the project might be concerned that their capital is at risk after five years if for some reason, which frequently happens um, for a whole variety of reasons that isn't the developer's fault. Um, if there are you know, project delays or cost overruns that, you know, that, that make it challenging for the project developer to hit that five-year milestone. Um, and uh, and you know, the last point on um, this bullet point number four is that um, when governments and investors might have the best of intentions and negotiate bilaterally for um, the investor to to develop social infrastructure and other um, sort of uh, uh, benefits for the community, there aren't always timelines and um, budgets associated with those commitments or those expectations that the government has. And so I think that we're starting to see um, a lot of these contracts between governments and investors become more public and transparent, and these issues are being raised. But it's certainly been um, been an issue in the past. Um, so I think you know the, the overall takeaway from this slide is that a lot of investors are just unaware of the nuances of doing business in these countries, and it's important for development practitioners like ourselves who understand these issues and who care about them, and for governments and um, and and the forms of um, the entities that, that provide concessionary capital to think about, you know, how do we incentivize investors to learn about these issues early on? How do we raise it to their attention? Um, and what sort of resources can we give them um, to, to do the right thing? And I'll walk through the challenges a little bit more. Um, the, the next slide. Um, it's just an example of all the different resources and guidelines um, that are out there for investors to turn to when they're doing work in these countries to ensure that, or to not necessarily to fully ensure, but to support them in um, you know, sustainable or responsible or ethical investments. I and mean, I know those words mean different things to different people, but I think we can agree for the purposes of this call, um, they're, they're uh, somewhat interchangeable. Um, these are great measures, but it can also be very confusing for an investor who um, is under a lot of pressure uh, to develop a project quickly. They don't know how to vet different um, you know, uh, environmental and social uh, consultants. And, um, and it, it's, it's, uh, there, if you look at, you know, for instance, the IFC performance standards and you look at the guidance notes, they're very long. So um, this is just to say that 
yes, resources are out there, but it can be very complex for an investor to wrap their arms around um, you know, which guidelines to follow and um, how, to, how to familiarize themselves with it and incorporate it into their business practices. Um, so I think it will be helpful to just talk a little bit about um, what investors go through when they're developing their projects and how they attract capital and what their, um, what their, their challenges are. Um, it's difficult to attract equity capital to any startup or project, but particularly in developing countries, um, is there are a number of unfamiliarities um, to investors that make it more challenging um, for a developer that's interested in doing an agribusiness project, for instance, to attract capital to it. Um, and and so, you know, developing countries are great because they offer frontier markets. And as we all know, there's, um, you know, for instance, in Africa, there's a lot of opportunity to address issues of food security and for investors. To um, you know, to to uh, increase their capital and for jobs to be created, but it needs to be done in a sustainable way. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to agribusiness and particularly primary agribusiness, uh, when you want to attract capital to any project, not just agribusiness, um, you know that project should be project or company or startup should be scalable. And in primary agribusiness, that, that requires typically a significant amount of land. Now, that land can be acquired um, directly um, and you know, shaped into a nucleus uh, um, plantation or farm. And, and the developer can farm that um, in a centralized way. Or that area can be, um, if, particularly if there are farmers already on it, it can be organized into a smallholder outgrow program for, um, for the project. And I can explain that a little bit more offline if people are interested. But um, you know, smallholder outgrow programs aren't, um, aren't a typical way of doing business in certain countries around the world, like the United States, where I'm based. So for investors who want to do ag projects from the United States, learning how to structure a smallholder farmer outgrow program, which can be more sustainable than the nucleus style project, can be difficult. Um, and um, you know, smallholder outgrow programs have benefits like the people who are living on the land can stay there. They have a new form of sustainable income because they sell their crops to the company. They learn um, you know, best practices and get capacity building from the company that's there. And the company has maybe a processing facility and has built roads and has other benefits. But it's just it's a it's a different kind of model. And um, and uh, I think that certain investors around the world, not necessarily from Asia, where smallholder or mo models are more popular, but but um, from places like the United States, it's a it's a learning experience. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of project timelines, a lot of the development work, like the environmental and social impact assessment, um, is done in the early stages with equity capital that's been raised. And um, projects are typically financed about 30% with um, equity capital. And then later, you know, the developer will go to lenders and raise uh, the rest for the build out in debt financing. And so there's very little equity capital available in the early stages of project development, which can put pressure on investors to, um, uh, in addition to other you know, timing constraints like we talked about earlier, where the government might also want the developer to develop quickly, or where even the communities say, you know, you've been here for you know, two years. You haven't done anything. You know, what's going on? And actually, Ironically, it takes time to put all the feasibility studies in place and the environmental and social impact um, studies in place and engage the communities and do the proper you know, groundwork before you really start to develop a project. But that all requires equity capital and time. And so um, you know, there's a challenge where a lot of investors um, you know, might might not invest as much up front at that stage in the environmental and social impact assessment, which is typically where the you know, stakeholder mapping, stakeholder engagement, um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, the kinds of issues that we're talking about today are assessed and um, management plans are then put in place. This is interesting because you know, lenders um, thankfully have uh, 
have many of them, not all of them, have adopted um, sustainability. I keep using the word sustainability, but standards that are um, focused on responsible project development in countries like the IFC performance standards um, or the equator principles, which incorporate the IFC performance standards. And, um, and that's great, but frequently um, and the, the project developer or investor has already done a lot of the initial groundwork up front like we were just talking about, done the ESIA prior to going to the lenders. So even if the lenders require an environmental and social impact assessment or ESIA that um, is according to international standards or the IFC performance standards, um, uh, you know, that, that work might not have been done up front. And then there will have to be a gap analysis to identify where gaps exist in the investor's work. And the investor might have to um, you know, backtrack and redo parts of their environmental and social impact assessment, or ESIA, or EIA, as some people call it, or SEIA, as some people call it. Um, or, um, you know, some, some damage might already have been done. Some people might have been resettled in a way that isn't in accordance with the IFC's recommendations on resettlement action plans. And so, um, and so you know, this can, this can cause problems. I think I actually moved on to my next slide without. That's this slide. Um, and I, I can see that people are asking questions, um, which I will get to. Um, I'm about to wrap up. Um, did I cover everything on this slide? Uh, the, the other thing is just that, you know, for a lot of um, entrepreneurs and um, smaller entities that are looking to do business in developing countries, they don't always have the resources that, you know, for instance, a multinational company has. And so um, there's, a, there's sometimes an unfair advantage in a multinational corporation that has the um, resources and flexibility to invest more up front versus um, more independent developers, which, you know, I'd, I don't think we should discriminate against independent developers at all. Um, it's great for, for entrepreneurs to want to do business and bring their innovative ideas to countries, but we need to find ways to um, support them. The next slide is just, I think I'm running a little bit short on time, so we'll just get through this. Um, this is just you know, an example of all the different stakeholders and their interests that an investor needs to balance when they're developing a project. And they all have different um, sort of you know, timelines and priorities. And so it, it's not always obvious to an investor up front um, how to navigate this sort of um, complex web of relationships. Also, you know, a lot of investors who think that they're more progressive will say, oh, I, invest, I engage with the community, but they'll engage with the, um, you know, traditional rulers or elders who aren't always um, aligned with, with um, people in those communities who they um, supposedly represent. And so that also poses a challenge that the ISC performance standards um, help uh, create recommendations for. Um, you know, on this slide, I just get into what can we do to be helpful to these investors um, in the early stages so that we don't run into a situation where they're named and shamed and where they start to shy away from public disclosure and, um, and engagement with, with the development community. Um, I, uh, I spent four years working with Bruce Robel of Heracles Farms, who some of you might be familiar with, who had the best of intentions in developing um, Heracles Farms and wanted to, uh, to create lots of jobs and address food security issues, but um, was not aware of um, some of these nuances that we've been talking about. And if somebody had helped him become aware, I, I joined the company after they acquired the land and some, um, some NGOs were already pretty upset with the company, so I wasn't there at that stage and, and tried to work with the company to address the situation, but it already sp spiraled a bit out of control where the company felt threatened by certain NGOs and, um, and really started to clam up. Um, and it, it was a real challenge to address the situation at that point. Um, but if there's engagement early on before a company feels threatened, 
then I think there's a real opportunity to, um, to work with that company um, through capacity building and through providing concessionary forms of capital. So, so what can we do? Um, we can educate investors. So, you know, one idea is for um, development finance institutions and NGOs to work together to structure facilities that offer concessionary forms of capital to investors early on to be part of the equity um, structure, or it can be it can be structured as not as equity, but it comes in at the early stage um, in order uh, in order to help um, fund real quality uh, environmental and social impact assessments and engagement um, that meets international standards and not just local regulation, which is what I, I think I meant to mention this earlier, but that's what a lot of investors just work to do, um, is meet local regulation, not international standards. It's cheaper. It's, you know, it, it meets the requirements at the time. Um, so you know, if there's more capital available to do it uh, according to international standards, that would be helpful. And then you know, in order for investors to access that capital, they might have required workshops, or they might have to partner with an approved um, consultant who advises them on how to use that capital, or something like that. Um, and um, there could also be something like an equator principles association. That's the that's the uh, association that I mentioned. The banker part of. Um, where they, they've committed to use the IC performance standards in their project development. Um, but um, but um, there could be a similar situation or association formed for equity investors who are committing capital at the earlier stages. We can also educate NGOs on some of the opportunities that I just mentioned. You know, how do you engage companies early on? Um, and, uh, and I think that there is a, a role for NGOs to both work with the investors directly as well as work with um, you know, the development finance institutions in creating these um, uh, incentives and opportunities for investors to do robust environmental and social risk management up front. And we can educate governments as well. So um, obviously governments influence development finance institutions so that place into the concessionary uh, capital idea. And um, you know, in terms of the, the countries that are receiving investment, uh, the developing countries, you know, can, they, can, can anything be, be done to encourage them to incorporate some of the elements of the IFC performance standards into their uh, regulatory frameworks and requirements? Um, and can more developed countries train their own investors who are making foreign direct investment abroad um, to be more responsible um, and, and can developed countries hold them accountable. And so I think that we'll see that there are a lot more solutions um, presented in, um, in the operational guidelines for responsible land-based investment, um, which you will learn about um, shortly. But, um, but those are just some of the, some of the that's some of the context. Um, that that uh, investors face um, in this in this um, discussion. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Delilah. We really appreciate your presentation. Uh, as you can see, a lot of questions have been coming in, so uh, we'll go ahead and verbally ask you a few of them. Um, but if we can't get to all of them, it would be great if before you have to depart, if you wouldn't mind, kind of coming through the chat box and maybe adding in some of your comments on what you have seen. That would be fantastic. Um, all right, so I'll start off with a question from Kurt Reinsma, uh, who is with the USAID. Delilah, what is your experience with investors from emerging economies? Whether investors are from developed or emerging economies, your presentation may assume that investors have the goodwill to learn about the issues if they are informed of the nuances, but what if they really don't care? Well, that, that's definitely um, an important point. Um, and, you know, my, my presentation is more, it's more directed to foreign direct investors. I do think that there are, um, there's a sensitive issue um, that arises out of this question, which is that, you know, for a lot of local investors who are developing, 
developing projects in their own countries, um, they frequently feel that their local regulatory framework is robust enough and that, um, you know, it's, it's almost the ISC performance standards and, and the international best practices that I'm referring to are um, sort of an imposition on, um, and not only an imposition, but an assumption that, you know, the, the developing country in question and their government is ignorant or, you know, hasn't, um, you know, doesn't know how to govern themselves. And so there's a real sensitivity around, you know, as, as people who endorse international best practices, I think by no means do we want to suggest that um, a developing country's government is ignorant or, you know, doesn't understand how to do things properly, and we don't want to be hegemonic about things. Um, I have not yet uh, had to face that situation myself. I've mostly worked with foreign direct investors who, um, you know, are, are willing um, and interested in complying with the IFC performance standards, um, which I typically use as my benchmark um, and set of guidelines. But, um, it, you know, like we go back and forth on, on the timelines and budgets around those, um, like I've discussed in my presentation. But um, I've, I've never really worked with um, an entire company or organization that has opposed, um, you know, working toward adoption of these standards. I worked with one person in a company who opposed it, and that was definitely a challenge and made my life very difficult. Um, but I still don't have the right, the, the solution for that. It's, it's politics. This is Tony. I also want to jump in on that question and just um, indicate that I think the next presentation um, is going to outline um, specifically some guidance that, that USAID uh, practitioners can apply to help uh, mitigate or protect, um, protect us from investments where the investor does not care um, about the issues that have been raised. So I, I would encourage um, Kurt to stay tuned for that next presentation because I think it will be really applicable to his question. The great question. All right, we have a question from Samson Conlin, who is with the USA admission in Ghana. Do you have any experience or recommended best practice on how to overcome the challenges inherent in the informal or customary landholder nuances and the need for ensuring that the required analysis doesn't put off or alienate the investor? Um, he says that in Ghana, under the Ghana Commercial Agricultural Project, which is funded by the World Bank and USAID, a land lease model has rather proven complex and does, does not seem to appeal to investors who are seeking larger land holdings. So how do we accomplish this without alienating an investor? Yeah, um, that's a, another great question. So um, I think it's important, and it's not just incumbent upon uh, Ghana, but it's also important for for countries where there's a lot of outgoing foreign direct investment, like the United States, for instance. Um, and this is really what I think USAID is trying to accomplish here, is to educate the investors on um, why those sort of structures and frameworks are important. Um, so. So one of the things that I sort of wrote out in my presentation that I didn't get into a lot is um, educating the investors on the risks of what happens if they uh, take too much land up front and don't develop it quickly or, you know, start to develop land that other people are living on or resettle people and don't compensate them according to international standards. And I think that there are starting to be some studies that have come out um, that highlight different cases where investors have run into two problems and complex um, issues. And I think this also you know, sort of addresses the first question about what do you do if investors just don't want to incorporate these standards. Um, I think that if you can highlight to them that there's a financial 
potential impact to the project and the probability of that negative financial hit taking place, if, that, if we can communicate that that's a significant enough risk, then they will probably start to understand why it's important to work with some of these frameworks and guidelines that we're creating. Thanks so much, Delilah. Does that answer the question? Yep. Um, no yes, I think so. Um, so we had a question come in about social impact assessments and what types you've seen in the private sector. Uh, what has been your experience? What do they look like? Social. So um, the question is, what what, um, what are like sort of the different types of social impact assessments, um, and how do they vary? I think so. Uh, the different types and whether they've been effectively used by the private sector. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's interesting because I think in a lot of countries, um, an EIA is required, not an ESIA. Um, and uh, usually, even though it's called an environmental impact assessment, EIA, as opposed to environmental and social impact assessment, ESIA, or SEIA, Social and Environmental Impact Assessment. Um, the assessments usually require, um, the governments that, that require those assessments usually also require some sort of subset that addresses um, social impact assessment. But, but when investors do these assessments, they have options in which consultants to work with. And so um, they can work with local consultants um, who are familiar with international best practices and standards. And so the social impact assessment might follow all the recommended um, measures that the IFC performance standards, for instance, would suggest. Um, or an investor can work with a consultant that's local that isn't familiar with international best practices, which frequently happens because initially the EIA is meant to just satisfy the local government and not an international lender. Um, so, you know, I've I've seen social impact assessments where there's, um, you know, there are. Um, assessments taken of how many people live in the area, what, what they do for an occupation, um, what kind of crops they plant, and the data's been really sparse and really bad and, and very inconsistent because, you know, on a, on a sort of, you know, intake form for different households, it might say, um, you know, what's the, what's the dominant ethnic group in this community? And, you know, all these different forms might say, you know, very different things but everybody's talking about the same community. And so it is, it's very challenging, um, you know, to, first of all, I think, you know, it's important if you, um, I think it's important to work with a consultant, whether it's local or international, and preferably local, because they, um, you know, it's job creation locally, but, you know, just make sure that they understand international standards or they work, you know, in conjunction with, and, ERM or URS, which are the larger consultancies that really, you know, have a sort of system um, and methodology for for doing the studies according to international best practices. Um, so, so one is, you know, working with those kinds of consultants. But then, when you when you have the consultants do these intake forms, it's just I think it's important to get the primary data as a project developer and just make sure that you know they they had enumerators who were thorough and, um, you know, reconciled um, conflicting information because frequently the data is pretty bad. Thank you, Delilah. I think we have just one more question to pose to you uh, before you take off. And this question is from Douglas Hertzler with ActionAid. Delilah, you mentioned outgrower schemes as being a better option than nucleus farms. It would be great if you could elaborate a bit on that. We see many nucleus farm projects that seem to include outgrowers as a secondary goal and a form of compensation, 
Um, a good outgrower scheme gives local farmers new options, but a nucleus farm takes up a large amount of local land and water. Can we encourage good outgrower schemes and avoid promoting large-scale land transfer? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So um, when I refer to um, nucleus and outgrower schemes, um, the model that I think works really well is when there is actually a nucleus um, farm that is managed by the company um, and that has you know, employees or workers farming for the company, and that also has you know whatever processing facility the company needs. So if it's palm oil, it's a you know palm oil mill. If it's grains, it's it's you know storage and in, in um, processing facilities for grains. But um, but um, the nucleus in those situations can then also source from neighboring outgrowers. And I think you know it's important for the company for their own motivations to provide capacity building to the outgrowers around them um, to ensure that the crops that they're providing to the company are high quality and um, you know, in the quantities that the company needs and so forth. Um, I think those models work really well. And then you know, the smallholders and outgrowers can stay on the land that they've had and um, have a secure buyer for their products, um, whereas they might not have had that before. Um, I think when I said nucleus before, when I was talking about nucleus or uh, outgrower smallholder programs, um, I was more referring to just you know company-owned um, farms that extend for uh, thousands of hectares. Um, I think you know those are more challenging to develop in a sustainable way. It's not impossible. Um, but it's just challenging because, as we know, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, there are frequently people who are going to be living on that land. And if you want it to just be a company-run, company-farmed piece of land, you're going to have to resettle those people. Um, so, so I'm just uh, in favor of, of um, considering the, the nucleus and outgrower program as opposed to just having one company managed um, farm or plantation that extends across uh, thousands of hectares. All right. Well, thank you very much for your thorough answers. We really appreciate you being with us today. And um, if you have a chance to throw any final comments in the chat box, that would be great. But we also understand that you need to take off shortly. Um, so we're very happy to have had you here today. All Thanks right. very much, and um, thank you, everybody. I'm sorry to miss you, Lou's presentation. I know it's going to be really good. And I'll try to answer a few more questions before I have to jump on my next call. Great, thanks. And of course, um, as a reminder to both Delilah and everyone else, this presentation is being recorded. Um, so if you missed any portion, you'll be able to uh, review it at, or in about a week's time when it's posted on AgriLinks. All right, so we'll go ahead and move along to Yulia. So Yulia, please, uh, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, can everybody hear me OK? I can hear you well. All right. Great. Um, so I apologize in advance if my voice is a little bit scratchy. I'm uh, in Ukraine and coming down with a bit of a cold, so hopefully it'll hold through this presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. And thank you, Delilah, for an excellent presentation that I think really uh, teed up the company perspective of where are the challenges and what are some of the avenues that the companies are uh, looking at for addressing some of these issues which we all know are quite uh, complicated and we're really just at the beginning of uh, <clears throat> this movement of trying to think through them. So my uh, presentation will concentrate on a tool that USAID has developed over the last year or so to try to help uh, companies uh, and also our missions who are working with private sector companies in thinking through and addressing some of the land tenure risks in uh, inherent in land-based investments. 
And what I'll do is, I realized I don't have a link to the actual document, the operational guidelines for responsible land-based investment in the presentation. So in our chat box, I've, uh, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna copy and paste the link in the chat box so that everybody can access it if you wish. All right. So <clears throat> Delilah did a great job of framing the issue already, but I'll uh, add just a bit more. So why did this need arise for this sort of gui guidance document? As Tony mentioned, since uh, 2008 or so, we've seen an uptick in uh, agricultural investment in developing markets. And the US government has supported this sort of investment through the New Alliance and through Feed the Future programming. But with this increased investment and all of the promise that this sort of investment can bring, there's also increased risk. So the risk of investing in uh, communities where land rights are not necessarily documented, where uh, most people hold informal uh, informal land rights and where the land governance framework on a domestic level may not be as robust as in uh, traditional uh, investment uh, venues. All of these factors pose uh, land tenure risks. So these are risks of displacing, disadvantaging, or negatively impacting local communities through a land-based investment. And for <clears throat> the investor and for USAID projects, this can have financial, operational, and reputational risks. The private sector uh, is increasingly aware of these risks. And also, we're seeing increasingly that the private sector is, wants to be a positive actor in the community, particularly in these long-term deals. Uh, the company is going to be working with the community, living in the community for decades. They want to have the social license to operate. They want to be a good member of the community. So the private sector you know, understands that good community relations and inclusive projects are key to sustainable investment. And in order to have a sustainable project, you need to take care of these sorts of land tenure risks. Uh, and to that end, private sector companies are increasingly committing to uh, international norms that uh, respect local land rights, uh, not only for the company itself, but throughout its supply chains, Col compliance with the VGGT that Tony mentioned. We've seen these sorts of um, compliance commitments come from large companies, Coke, Pepsi, Unilever. So the problem that we're now facing is that we see that the private sector wants to invest in agriculture in developing countries, particularly we're seeing this in Africa, and understands that in order to successfully invest, it must address these land tenure considerations. But it doesn't know how. So this brings us to <clears throat> the purpose of the operational guidelines. In response to private sector inquiries and as part of a larger movement to clarify the question around sustainable agricultural investment, USAID has developed operational guidelines that provide practical advice, or seek to provide practical advice at every stage of the investment life cycle, so from upfront due diligence to project closeout, on how to structure responsible land-based projects. And this guidance document aligns with the relevant elements of the voluntary guidelines, of the IFC performance standards, and other standards. And it's important to note that in developing the voluntary, uh, the operational guidelines, we're not, these are not an endorsement of large scale land acquisition in exclusion of smallholder farming. Uh, and this relates a bit uh, back to Doug's point about the difference between nucleus farming and outgrower projects. And in fact, in our guidance, we really stress that if at all possible and available, uh, the investor should be considering uh, outgrower schemes, contract farming, so to the greatest extent possible incorporating uh, the local community into the investment in a meaningful way, not just in a nominal way. Uh, but you know, there's a recognition that 
a large scale investment is happening, and if it's going to happen, and you know host governments are uh, excited to receive this investment, it should be done responsibly. So, the primary audience for uh, these guidelines are new alliance partners uh, and USAID missions who support these partners and uh, missions in new alliance feed the future com uh, countries. But really, these guidelines are relevant to any company uh, who is investing in a market where uh, these sorts of challenges are occurring. Uh, the primary focus in terms of types of companies is companies considering land acquisition. Uh, but also, this is relevant to companies who are monitoring their supply chains. So for example, these large companies who are making commitments throughout their supply chain, they may not necessarily be acquiring land, but their supplier might be. So these companies, when they make commitments to be compliant with the voluntary guidelines, that means that they need to make sure that their suppliers are compliant. And then finally, agricultural projects are the primary focus of the guidelines, but <clears throat> really the guidelines are applicable to any project involving potential land acquisition. So this can be a um, infrastructure project, an extractives project, any project where uh, acquiring land is in question. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do is just quickly run through um, the contents of the operational guidelines. Like I said, they are structured in a chronological fashion. So the first chapter deals really with land-based due diligence. And this is diligence that should be done up front, um, you know, not only before a contract is signed, but before a company even makes a go, no-go decision on the investment. So this uh, diligence should go into the company's baseline decision of whether or not to go forward with an investment. What does land-based due diligence looks like, look like? First, it involves identifying pos possible project locations and identifying what the current land ownership and occupancy is in that location, seeing if there are existing maps of the area uh, and other existing information. Uh, then hearing out the actual due diligence of who will be affected by the potential land acquisition and how. So, this really gets down to stakeholder analysis. Um, the operational guidelines contain a discussion of the range of different stakeholders who could be impacted by the investment. So not just the local, immediate local community, but members within the national and local government, community leaders, indigenous groups, pastoralists. Uh, this is an important consideration, particularly um, in countries where there are nomadic or semi-nomadic pastoral populations, when you come in you know, and do a quick survey of an area, that pastoral population may not be there at that point, but three months later, when you come back, they may be. Women, uh, other community partners, but also company suppliers and customers, and the media. Uh, the other important uh, component of land-based due diligence is understanding the legal framework in the country when it comes to land. And this includes both formal and customary law. Uh, so looking at provisions that include ownership, lease, transfer, takings of land, uh, and understanding how land transactions are structured in your country context. And then finally, as Delilah mentioned, conducting environmental and social impact assessments. So, the result of all of this preliminary diligence, which should be time-consuming, uh, you know, it's not a quick exercise and it's not a one-off exercise, uh, but the result of all of this diligence should really feed into a go, no-go decision. Do the rewards and benefits, both for the company and for the local community, outweigh the risks? And if they don't, the company shouldn't proceed with the investment. But if they do, uh, then the company moves to the next part of the guidelines, which involve stakeholder engagement. So what does this consist of? First, raising awareness. Uh, and this both means raising awareness within the local community about the proposed project, and also for the company to educate itself 
about the local community, what are the factors at play, and the point of this exercise is to minimize the asymmetry of information between the investor and those who are likely going to be affected by the project. We know from experience that this is a huge issue, uh, so any actions that can bring people onto the same page will, uh, will be positive. So what types, of, what types of information are we talking about? We're talking about background about the investor, about the sector, the purpose of the project, what are the projected impacts, both positive and negative? What's the proposed geographic scope of the project? What are the types of land and resource rights that are being sought? The proposed business model, the timeline, what are the alternatives? Then, after the awareness raising is the consultation. And we put the consultation purposefully after the awareness raising because it's really critical that, you know, before you start to consult, with a community, everyone has the same information in front of them to the extent possible. So when you're consulting with the local community and other stakeholders about the project, uh, what does that look like? Usually it involves a smaller group of people than the broad due diligence exercise, and it narrowly concentrates on issues that are related to the project. But it involves enough people that you are ensuring that the community's interests at large are taken into account. So you're discussing uh, the interests in the land, how the land will be used, uh, other factors including uh, alternatives to acquisition, for example, uh, alternatives for smallholder uh, or contract farming and uh, outgrower schemes. These consultations, uh, a lot of the guidance we offer concentrates on the how. How do you conduct these consultations? How do you conduct them in a way that's voluntary, inclusive, open, honest, collaborative, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, based on shared information and also allowing meaningful opportunities for feedback? So consultation isn't a one-way street, right? It means speaking with the community, but also hearing what they have to say and meaningfully taking that into account. And uh, what we recommend as best practice is reaching some sort of an interim agreement that memorializes the terms that were uh, agreed upon during the consultation. So this can be an MOU with the local community or other stakeholders. The next uh, section of the operational guidelines deals with an issue that we actually originally had put into the community engagement section, but it was a technically challenging enough issue that we decided to break it out on its own. Uh, and we've actually received a lot of interest on this particular topic. And that's mapping. So <clears throat> once you've agreed on some basic terms with the community, you need to map, map the actual proposed project land and map it with the community. So what is participatory? mapping look like. Um, it lo it's basically relying on the local knowledge of the community in concert with more modern mapping tools to identify the different land uses, uh, land ownership structures, points of access, and other features that are uh, particular to the plot of land that's being considered local stakeholders must be part of the mapping process. And by local stakeholders, we don't just mean the village council elders. We mean women and other vulnerable groups, uh, not just for the purpose of inclusion, but for because they have unique and specific information that they can offer. We've seen that women, for example, use land in different ways that men do. So they may know, for example, water access points that <clears throat> men may not know about, and that may be critical you know, uh, to ensuring the sustainability of the project. So this sort, of map result, this sort of mapping exercise results in a community map that is then shared with the community and together with the community, the investor vets the map, makes sure, it's, makes sure that it's accurate, and makes sure that everyone's views are taken into account. 
the next section involves the actual contract negotiation. And this is really a uh, tricky part of the process because as Delilah mentioned, often we're talking about informal rights. So the, um, so while the signatories to the contract officially may be the government of country X and the investor, you have uh, legitimate landowners who may not be the formal landowners. And how do you take their considerations into account in structuring the contract? So this section really gets into <clears throat> First, considering the alternatives to large-scale acquisition, so how do you structure a contract farming or outgrower scheme contract? Then, the type of acquisition. So, traditional concession agreements usually involve long-term leases, but there are other formats, for example, benefit-sharing agreements. So, the community takes an equity stake in the venture, um, or, uh, you know, where it's sharing the risk, but also the revenue generated by the project. Each of these alternatives has its own pros and cons. For example, leasing may be more stable uh, over the long term, but benefit sharing has a higher upside potential for local communities. At the same time, it's riskier. So the operational guidelines speak a little bit about, uh, about these nuances. And then, of course, an important part of any sort of contract is the compensation. So if you're in a situation, not even necessarily where people need to be relocated, uh, and we really advocate strongly against any sort of a concession that uh, requires relocation, but where you may need to uh, compensate the local community for economic loss. So for example, <clears throat> they're losing access to some of their farmland. Uh, how do you go about determining what is fair and adequate compensation? So we talk about land valuation. How do you va value land in a thin market? where you can't use, for example, the comparable sales method. And we talk about different types of compensation. So ongoing compensation, for example, uh, is preferable to a one-time lump sum. But how do you determine the mix of cash, in-kind, uh, infrastructure, other development services, et cetera? So this is a pretty meaty section that gets into some of these technical details. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> we have a section on uh, project operations. And this section is actually the shortest one in the entire guidance document. And that's on purpose, because we take the view that really the hard work on this point needs to be done at the very first stages of the project. Um, if you've done a good job in your due diligence and in your uh, negotiations, you shouldn't be running into major issues during project operations. So, but nonetheless, this uh, section contains some information on continuing engagement. So how do you keep engaging with the community? Your project is going to change over its life cycle. So how do you form an oversight committee to make sure that there's communication, excuse me, uh, if, for example, you need to expand the project or contract the project or if there are changes to what was originally agreed upon. Then monitoring, of course. How do you ensure that the project complies with the terms of the land acquisition contract, uh, complies with any regulatory obligations relating to land acquisition that weren't ca captured in the contract, and that the project isn't causing adverse social and environmental impacts on the community? And then we speak briefly about a grievance mechanism or a dispute resolution mechanism. So <clears throat> how can a company develop an independent dispute resolution or grievance mechanism that's proportional, transparent, culturally appropriate, accessible to the local population, and uh, you know, offers appropriate protection? So that is uh, kind of a brief overview of the guts of the operational guidelines. Just a quick note on next steps. So as Delilah mentioned, you know, there has been there have been several efforts to produce these sorts of guidance documents, and uh, companies need a little bit more. Uh, they need assistance in picking up these tools and um, actually using them. So we're really looking at ways to assist companies on this front, and we're not the only ones. 
the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition Leadership Council recently approved a document that was actually developed jointly by ourselves as well as several other G7 donors, the African Union and the FAO, called the Analytical Framework for Investors under the New Alliance, Due Diligence and Risk Management for Land-Based Investments in Agriculture. Again, long name, I guess we're fond of them. But this is a framework that uh, basically helps investors assess the risk in land-based investments and points them to resources in how to address these risks. It heavily references the operational guidelines and the new alliance through Grow Africa is currently thinking through uh, how to roll out this tool and how to actually um, see that companies take it up. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Yulia, for your presentation. Uh, all we have about 15 minutes left for Q&A, so please go ahead and enter any questions you have for Yulia, or if you'd like them to be more generally about land governance, um, we'll see if we can answer those as well. And um, so we'll dive in with a question from Anthony Medeiros. Uh, do we offer recommendations on the use of community land trusts to prevent dispossession rather than just individual titling? Or have our recommendations focused more on the investor social responsibility side? Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, that's a great question. And yes, the operational guidelines do talk about the operational guidelines. We definitely, in, uh, we definitely support it as a best practice for ensuring that compensation is delivered in a uh, transparent and equitable way and that, you know, funds or in-kind or whatever the compensation is gets to everyone who it's intended to get to. Great, thank you. And we're glad to hear you back. You sound very, or have you back. You sound very clear. Um, so we've received lots of kudos to your presentation. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, another question from Kurt Reyensma from USAID. I know you said that we are only now looking at rolling this out, these guidelines, but do we have examples at this point of investors having actually used these or similar guidelines in the past? So the short answer is that I don't, in my experience, I have not seen an investor take a guidance document soup to nuts and follow it. I think that what investors do is they pick and choose portions of the guidelines, uh, you know, either ours or other guidance documents that are relevant to them. And, you know, often what we see is that uh, companies, when they run into problems, they'll start looking or searching or they'll hire a consultant and then they'll turn to these sorts of guidance documents. And what we're trying to move companies towards is using these guidelines or similar ones ahead of time because oftentimes when you're kind of putting out fires and trying to turn to guidance uh, when the problem has already erupted, you may already have lost your social license to operate in a community or you may have done a significant amount of damage. So we're trying to encourage companies to really methodically do this up front. But I do know that uh, large companies, uh, you know, such as the ones who have commu committed to the voluntary guidelines, have been looking uh, critically at these sorts of guidance documents and trying to fold them into some of their operations. Great. Thank you, Yulia. Um, so another question from Lillian Bruce. It is impressive to have these guidelines, but what would these be achieving differently from the VGGT or voluntary guidelines by FAO and the AU guiding principles for large scale acquisitions? Again, whose responsibility is to administer this due diligence? Who implements, who monitors, and who sanctions? I think there's a need for a bit of clarity on that. Thanks, Lillian. So the point of these guidelines is to basically bring down 
So the VGGTs and the AU principles are at kind of a 30,000 foot level. So they set out large uh, principles that the private sector and that governments should comply with. And the space where guidelines live is basically trying to help companies figure out how do we actually do it. So the guidelines are much more uh, specific and technical, and they're intended to be a bit more of a uh, manual, as a, you know, basically a manual or a roadmap for how to meet those commitments that are outlined in the VGGTs or the AUFNGs. Uh, in terms of the question of who this responsibility falls for, uh, or falls to, this is a really <clears throat> interesting question and quite a fraught issue because basically what we're venturing into in these uh, types of scenarios is that um, governments are not fulfilling functions that are traditionally government functions. So like, for example, uh, clarifying land rights. And companies are in the position of, if they want to have a secure social license to operate, and they want to make sure that they're doing no harm, and uh, even going a step further, benefiting the community, they basically are in a position where they have to take on some of these government functions. And that's the whole <clears throat> reason that this sort of guidance is needed, because companies aren't used to, this isn't their core business model or their core practice. They're not used to performing these functions. It's not their area of technical expertise. And they're finding themselves in situations where if they want to be a good player in the community, they have to do it. So uh, we're seeing companies increasingly kind of stick their neck out and say, I'm going to try to be a you know, good citizen of the community, and I'm going to try to uh, take on these commitments. Great, thank you very much. We have a question from Simon Hull, uh, who honed in on a piece of your presentation where you spoke about preliminary identification based mm -hmm. on existing maps and information. What about situations where land tenure is not codified, maps are out of date, or there is no documentary evidence of land rights or of conflicts with the situation on the ground? How is the community engaged there? Kind of a nuts and bolts question about to start. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very practical question because the reality of the situation is that that's often the case. And really, that's where engaging with the community is so critical because um, let, let's say that the better case scenario of the ones mentioned, you have a map that was provided to you by uh, the district government, and it's 10 years out of date, and it's full of mistakes. Uh, you know, being able to ground truth it with the community is essential, because the local community is going to know where boundaries are, uh, what land is being used for what. So this is where really engaging with the community is critical, because they're going to be your um, kind of biggest resources in figuring out what the existing map, so to speak, is. And another really good tool is uh, engaging with local NGOs and civil society organizations, because these organizations can really be your liaison, because they've been working with the local community, they're knowledgeable, and uh, they can really be a good bridge uh, and help with identifying the right people in the community to speak with. Uh, even kind of uh, perking, perking your ears up to potential red flags, issues, what the internal politics are, uh, so they can be a really great uh, ally in these sorts of nitty-gritty uh, endeavors. Great. Well, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, we had a question come in from Chloe Christman who says, I've seen several sector actors require guidance or assistance to remedy land conflicts that have resulted in part because they didn't do the kind of due diligence you referenced when they first started the project. 
How can USAID or the new alliance support companies in resolving these conflicts and doing their due diligence? That's a great question. Uh, great question, Chloe. And uh, you're putting me on the spot a little bit. I think that uh, both USAID and the new alliance has uh, expressed a real interest and commitment in supporting responsible uh, practices in this area of land-based investment. I think that the new alliance, um, you know, a approving this, uh, the new alliance grid, as we call it, this risk assessment document that was put together jointly by the U.S. and other actors is uh, really indicative of its intention to make some real progress in this area and actually offer support to companies. So uh, currently, you know, we are in discussions of how concretely to support uh, the rollout and support companies in their efforts to comply and in their efforts to mitigate risk but also address the risk if it occurs. So we absolutely welcome suggestions and are open to suggestions and ideas on that front. Uh, I think it's certainly a joint effort. Thank you so much, Julia. I think that uh, we're running out of time, and so that will be our last question. I'm going to pass it over to Tony for a couple of closing comments. Thanks, Julie. I just wanted to um, invite people to continue this conversation uh, with USAID's land tenure and uh, resource governance staff, either through Twitter using the hashtag land matters or by communicating directly with us through email, which is uh, landmatters at USAID.gov. Uh, we also maintain uh, an information and knowledge management portal uh, with all of the agency's resources on this topic that is hosted on uh, USAIDLandTenure.net. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. It was a pleasure to work with you. A pleasure to have you, Yulia and Delilah, who had to leave us. Um, so, And especially, always a pleasure to have our participants. You are the reason that we continue with these seminars. So thank you very much for participating today. AgriLinks will take a hiatus from uh, seminars and webinars in August, as we always do, to uh, spend some time strategizing for the future. And um, so we'll be back in September. And we're, in the fall, we're looking at holding um, some seminars on possibly aflatoxin and mycotoxins, potentially gender, climate smart agriculture. So it, we'll, we'll hope to have a good lineup for you um, of seminars and webinars in the fall. And as always, we always appreciate your input uh, to help us improve these seminars. So if you wouldn't mind taking our polls before you head out, that would be fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful August, and we'll see you in the fall. <laughs>